Amen. Do you believe that, that he's here? Do you believe it? Second service, you were way too quiet. We're going to have to work on this. I need a lot of amens today. We're going to go through some awesome scripture. All scripture is awesome, but this scripture is really, really good. So are you ready? Yes, there you go. There you go. Okay, so go to John chapter 18. So we are second to last message in Lord Overall. We're in John chapter 18. We've got just a few miracles left in this series before we move on to the series called You Asked For It, where we're going to go over your questions and your topics. But we're still talking about Jesus. We're still talking about the miracles that he did while he was on this earth. And John chapter 18 is one of his final miracles. So verse 1, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and he entered a grove of olive trees. This is Gethsemane. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, the other Gospels also talk about the same exact scene we're about to go over. They give us the detail that it's in Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, if you don't know, this is the place where Jesus has his final time with God the Father in prayer before he goes to the cross. And do you remember? And he goes to God and he says, God, is there any other way to save mankind? Because if there's an option B, I'd really like option B. Have you ever wanted option B from God? Come on. You know you have. I've wanted it a lot. So Jesus goes to God and says, is there an option B? Because, man, if there's an option B, I'd rather not suffer. I'd rather not go through this torture. I'd rather not die. I'd rather not be separated from you, Father, if there's an option B. And God says, go through with it. And says that Jesus sweat drops of blood in that moment while he was going through that prayer. And he said, at the end of the day, not my will, but your will be done, God. And he decides, he makes the commitment, he's ready to go to the cross. And do you remember where the disciples were while Jesus was going through all of that? All right, he was, they were all sleeping. They were all sleeping, not going through prayer with him. So anyway, they walk to Gethsemane. Verse 2, Judas the betrayer knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. And the leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches and lanterns and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Now, you got this, this underlined here, contingent. Uh, so, so, so important. Uh, it, it's the, the Greek word there is spira, spira. Say spira. Spira, this is a very specific word in, in, in the Greek. It means a military cohort. It's one-tenth of a legion. It's about 600 men, fully armed, with torches, coming to get Jesus. And who's at the head? Judas, right? Judas is one of Jesus' disciples. Judas, Judas had decided to betray Jesus, and he leads this cohort into the Garden of Gethsemane to come after Jesus, and there's six, at least 600. Some scholars think there may be as many as 1,000 or 1,200 soldiers that are a part of this, at least 600, armed to the teeth. Now, if you've seen, like, the movie version of Jesus before, like you might have an image in your head of the Garden of Gethsemane and maybe like, you know, 10 or 15 soldiers, they show up to get Jesus, 600, 600. I'm not exaggerating. Research it for yourself. 600 soldiers filled that space. And Garden of Gethsemane, it was a, it was a massive area. It was an entire hillside and there were, there were, there were gardens there. there. There were tombs there. There were caves there. It was a network of caves that were there. And it's filled with soldiers. And you got to ask yourself why. So why, why bring that many soldiers against Jesus? A couple reasons. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Right? Like, like he's got power. If you guys remember that week, we talked about the fact that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, that they actually put a warrant out for Lazarus' arrest as well as Jesus. They knew they had to kill him because he was the evidence that Jesus had resurrection power. And one of the things you see all through the Gospels, and as we focused on Jesus' miracles, we've seen it a lot here as well, is that they were always trying to see what the limit of Jesus' power was. Like, yeah, you healed that guy, but at what point do you run out, Jesus? Yeah, you did this thing over here, but you, can you really do just anything? 
It's one thing to see somebody as a miracle worker. It's a different thing entirely to see them as God. So what was the discussion like? Should we take 100 soldiers? Ah, it might not be enough. Let's do 600. 6,000 wouldn't have been enough. So they send 600 armed to the teeth at night, lanterns. They're, going to, they're ready to search for Jesus. They're ready to come against him. They don't know what they're about to do, but here they come. Verse 4, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. This is his commitment to the cross. He's about to go to the cross. He knows how this is going to go down, so he steps forward to meet them, right? Like he doesn't hide. He doesn't run. So many times up to this point, it says that they came against Jesus and they would just lose Jesus. He would just drift into the crowd or whatever, but they could never get their hands on him. Finally, this is the moment and Jesus knows it, so Jesus steps forward to them. And what does he say? Who are you looking for, he asked. Verse 5, Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. What he's asking them for is, what's the name on your warrant of arrest? You got a parchment there? Who are you here after? We're after Jesus the Nazarene. Really? You mean the little peasant, Jewish carpenter, sometimes Bible teacher, Jesus of, of Nazareth? And you brought 600 people against me? Jesus the Nazarene, they replied, verse 5, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas who betrayed him was standing with them. Judas is on the wrong side of the line, amen? And as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. So just a couple points here. When he says, I am he, you guys might remember from before when Peter and Jesus were walking on the water and Jesus came up and they thought he was a ghost. And what does he say? He says, ego, A-M-I, A-me, sorry, ego, A-me, ego, A-me. Those are the two Greek words, I am, I am. It's the divine name Jesus is declaring. He's saying, I'm not just a God. I'm not just God, little G. I'm not some random God or vague God. I am the I am, Yahweh from the Old Testament, I am. And he declares it again right here. Except this time that he declares it, they all fall to the ground. 600 men fully armed with torches inside of a garden. Jesus speaks it and his breath and his word goes out and they all fall to the ground. Can you imagine that scene? That's a loud scene right? Like, where's my spear, right? Like, what just happened to us? Kind of, you gamers out there, this is like splash damage, right? Like, Jesus lets off a little explosion, and they all just fall. 6,000 wouldn't have been enough. If they brought 60,000, they all would have fallen, right? Someday, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether they surrender willingly or unwillingly, the breath of God itself will go out. And the same power that created this universe from scratch out of nothing can get anything done that he wants. He is irresistible in his will if he chooses to be. And in that moment, Jesus shows exactly who they're dealing with. Doesn't matter how many soldiers you brought, you're all going down. This is a moment. This is a, another one of those God moments. You wondered what the limit of my power was? How about all of you go down? And he's about to go to the cross. And some of you guys know that in, in John chapter 10, he had said, no one takes my life from me. I only give it willingly. And he's making it clear you think you've come to arrest me. You think you've come to drag me against my will to a cross. None of this will be against my will. And so he just makes it clear to them. Just so we're not confused. If I walk off with you, it's because I chose to walk off with you. Whew. Are you excited? Gosh. Even 2 Thessalonians 2, this is just a little treat. Um, there's a moment in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says one day the Antichrist will be revealed if you're someone who likes to say the end times and Jesus will destroy him by the breath of his mouth. It'll, it won't be a fight, okay? It won't take very long. Verse 7, once more he asked them after they had all stood up again, he kind of gives them a moment, like, you know, gather yourself up. You okay? Everybody okay? 
Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. Now, when you've read this before, you might think, why the repetition, Jesus? You already said, who are you after? You already said, read the warrant. We're after Jesus the Nazarene. Why ask them to read it again? Here's why. It happens, he tells you in verse 8, I told you that I am he, Jesus said. No power behind the words this time. And since I am the one that you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those that you have given me. So watch what Jesus is actually doing here in this moment. He says, read the warrant. You're after Jesus. And that's it. You don't get my disciples. Let's be clear. The, 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 the warrant says me, it doesn't say them. And just in case you decide to get excited as a soldier and just scoop us all up to the crosses, nope, just me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna floor you just so that you know how in control and in charge I am. Is Jesus in control? Yes, he is. Absolutely in control. Verse, verse 10, after Jesus is so in control, then Simon Peter loses control. Uh, Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, and there's so much detail here, watch this. Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup of, of suffering that the Father has given me? See, he's already decided. He knows how this is going to go. He's like, I've already decided to do this. Why are you getting in the way right now, Peter? Matthew 26, when it talks about this scene, it says that uh, Jesus also says to Peter, all those who take up the sword will die by the sword. And again, he's saying, Peter, listen, I'm here also to protect you. Like, I'm going willingly, but I don't want you to go. I'm here to protect you. Please put the sword away. Don't get involved in this conflict. And then Luke 22 says, And one of them struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said no more of this. And then he touched that man's ear. That's Malchus. Touched his ear and he healed him. Notice it doesn't say that he picked up the old ear and put it back on his ear. Jesus might have recreated an ear from scratch right against his head. I don't know. It doesn't say. How do you think it happened? It was power regardless. Jesus takes old, dead flesh and makes it come alive. I don't know how he did it. But Jesus takes care of Malchus. And so the soldiers and their commanding officer, verse 12, and the temple guards, they arrested Jesus and tied him up. So Jesus does two really big miracles in and these are our, 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 our two miracles for today. Is he shows his godlike power when they come and he drops them all. He's God. And he does this. And, and the fact that these two are together, it, it's so, so important. And then the second miracle that he does is he comes to Malchus and he heals his ear. And in between those two miracles is Peter. Peter and his sword. And the fact that those two things happen together is massive for us to understand exactly what's going on in this scene. Because Jesus showed his power. And whenever we hear about Peter taking up his sword and slicing at, at, at Malchus's ear, by the way, was he aiming for his ear? Heck no. He was aiming for his head. And he's a really bad shot, right? Peter's a better fisherman than he is a soldier. So this is a miss. Put your sword away, Peter. Jeez. Jesus has just floored 600 people, and then Peter takes his sword out. Why take your sword out after Jesus just floored 600 soldiers? That's weird. Right, like my little toothpick sword, who am I going to help? You can't even hit your target, Peter. Who are you going to help? What's he doing? What motivates him? You're like, well, he's trying to save Jesus. Really? 
Are you trying to save Jesus when Jesus is obviously in control of the situation? No, you're not trying to save Jesus. What are you trying to do, Peter? What's going on? If he's so clearly in control, why do you need to pull your sword out of the sheath? Unless you don't like what Jesus is about to decide to do. We'll come back to that. Why did Jesus heal Malchus? Say Malchus. Malchus. So the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, enemy is one that is antagonistic to another. Or one seeking to injure or overthrow or confound or confuse an opponent. That's what an enemy is. Malchus was an enemy. Malchus, let's be real about Malchus so that we understand the story. Malchus is no angel, amen? He no angel. He came with a contingent of soldiers to have the Lord of glory, the Savior of the universe, arrested and killed. He's no angel. So Malchus is part of that. Malchus chose what team he was going to be on. Malchus walked in there knowing what was going down. So Malchus is no angel. Why does Malchus get a healing? Malchus is the enemy of Jesus. Here's here's part of the thing I think for us to understand is, is someone can be an enemy of us in their minds, but we don't have to be an enemy back. They can enemy me. I don't have to enemy them. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men, Paul said. And so what's, what's my choice in the matter? Like, they might hate me. They might come against me. They might see themselves as my enemy. But how do I respond? See, that's, that's what matters for the Christian. How do I respond? And Jesus responds to Malchus by healing his ear. Does he owe that man a miracle? Heck no. Didn't owe that man a miracle. Should let him, let him sit there and bleed. But he's protecting his disciples, including Peter. He's going to clean up Peter's mess right now. Peter absolutely blows this whole thing. We're all like, you know, Peter, you know, and his three, three denials of Jesus and stuff. Oh, he blows it way before that. And Jesus still has to clean it up, still has to protect his disciple, and he absolutely does. But what else does Jesus do? Jesus comes to an enemy in the midst of the garden. It's his very last miracle. Don't miss this. It's his very last miracle right before he takes the cross, and Jesus heals an enemy and restores an enemy. Right before he heals all the enemies of God and restores all the enemies of God on the cross. Because isn't that what the cross is? So that's not lost on me. Malchus. Why do we even know the name Malchus? Ask yourself that. Some scholars think, so we don't know this for sure. Some scholars think there's a reason that we know not just the high priest's servant, but we know his name is Malchus. There's there's a few reasons. Sometimes we'll know the name of the individual person in the biblical text because one of the disciples knew that person personally. So it's possible that John, the writer of the book of John, knew Malchus personally because he, he knew some other people in the high priest's household. That's possibility. The other possibility, sometimes we get somebody's name because they later converted to Christianity, became part of the church, and everybody while the gospels were written says, oh yeah, I know Malchus. Is it possible that the healing miracle of Jesus got through to an enemy and he became an enemy no longer? possible. So let's look at why Jesus did this. First off, Jesus restores his enemies. He restores the enemies of God to friendship because that's what Jesus does, and he does not retaliate. First Peter 2.21 says this, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. What do you mean, Jesus? How are, how are you our example? What steps are we supposed to follow? He tells you, verse 22, he never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge. When he suffered, he left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Jesus left his entire situation in God's hands and says, I'm not going to fight it. And some of you guys know the prophecy said in the book of Isaiah, like a lamb before its shears is silent. So the son of man, the suffering servant himself, would be silent before his accusers. And he was. 
He allows himself to be carried off. And this, by the way, is not pacifism. Don't go there. It's not pacifism. It's not Christians sitting down saying we don't do anything. Jesus wasn't passive. He was not inactive. Jesus was very active. And he's going to call us to action, just not the action sometimes that we want. Next, Romans 5, 10. Jesus restored his enemies. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. See, Jesus should have looked up to Peter right in the moment after he slashed the man's ear. And he should have said, what you're missing, Peter, is Malchus isn't the only enemy here. Peter, you're also the enemy of God. I'm going to the cross for you, Peter. I'm going to the cross for you and for Malchus, both of you. What do you mean, Peter's? Isn't Peter on Jesus' side and isn't there a line? A lot of the lines, guys, are lines that we make in our own minds. And Jesus wasn't making this line. This was a line that Peter made, and he put Malchus on the other side of it, and Jesus shoves them both in the same one and says, no, I came for all the enemies of God. And sorry, Peter, but you've lived a lie your entire life, and you lived for yourself and for your own agenda, and you've been selfish, and you've breathed destruction onto all kinds of people over your life, Peter. Face it, man. So many days of your life, you've acted like the enemy of God through your actions, maybe not your words, but through your actions. And every single one of you guys gathered here today in church and online, do you realize that from the position of Scripture, you are an enemy of God? <sighs> Let me give a second for that to settle in. Aren't we? Like we speak a good game and we put this, you know, bumper sticker on our car. But do we walk the way of Jesus? The whole reason you needed to come to God and ask for his forgiveness is because you have lived your life as an enemy of God. And if there's a line, you're on the other side of it. So am I. And if we can get that, we won't go looking for Malchus's to swing swords at. It'll change us as people. We have to embrace the idea that Jesus came for us as well as for them. See, in the, in the church, we do a really good job of, of calling out other groups of people in our culture and saying they're the ones against God. Do we not? They're the ones against God. And we're kind of known for this in the church. Hey, you guys are so judgmental, and sometimes we are. And in, in order to make ourselves feel better about our own Christianity and our own position before God and our own character, a lot of times we pick out other little pet groups and we say, don't we hate those people? And as pastors, we can get up on the stage and say, don't we hate those people? And you guys, ah. It's so great to feel like we've got a common enemy. Except that scripturally, we are the enemies of God. And we needed a savior. And we've got no right to call out any other people groups and say they're the enemies of God. Am I, am I being too confrontational this morning? Because I've been there. I've done this. I'm walking in repentance just like you are with this today. Jesus said, love your enemies. Matthew 5, But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. This is the ethic of Jesus Christ. He says, you are to pray for your enemies, you're to love them, and you're to bless them. You remember where he said, turn the other cheek? If they strike you, turn the other cheek. If they ask for something, you should give it to them. That's how you should treat your enemies. See, Jesus had taught his disciples that. He had, taught, he had said, listen, this is how your father does it. He gives, everybody gets rain, right? I don't care how evil they are, they get rain, and they get sun, and they can grow crops, and they can have a life, and they can enjoy marriage, and they can enjoy children, no matter how evil they are. Isn't this what, like, this is true. The father doesn't have to do that. He could have made every single blessing across time contingent on people's morality, and he didn't. He gives all those gifts and all of those blessings regardless. And he says, and I want you to act toward people the exact same way. And when they cross you, 
and you think they're on the other side of the line from you, I want you to love and pray and bless. I want you to heal. So how in the world does Peter get a sword in his hand and go after Malchus? If Jesus had taught him that, how did Peter get here? I don't think Peter was trying to protect Jesus. I think Peter had other things on his mind. Some of you might know in Matthew 26, is earlier in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus starts to tell the disciples, he says, you know what, a day's going to come where they're going to arrest me and they're going to kill me. And he tells the disciples that. And do you remember how Peter responds to that? He didn't like that. He says, no, Jesus. <laughs> Two words that should never, ever go together for a Christian. No, Jesus. He says, heaven forbid. He says, you won't die. They won't arrest you. This won't happen. Nah, Jesus. I'm more of a faith person. Why don't you talk more optimistically? Why don't you talk positive? Why don't you have a positive view of the future? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking other promises over you right now, Jesus. I got a different plan. Like, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you remember? So you don't have in mind the things of God. What did Peter have in mind right there? Well, Peter had left his nets. He had left his job. He had left his whole career for Jesus. Right? He had, he had put everything he had on black 27 at the roulette table, right? And it hit. And it was great. It's like, he's actually the Messiah. Who'd have thought? Like, I chose to follow him, put everything into him, and everything's been working great. We go town to town, and he works miracles, and he's actually God. And, and look at me, I'm a leader in this whole movement, and this is fun, and he's really popular, and everybody loves Jesus, which means they kind of love me, and I want this to go on forever. You ever get on a spiritual high, and you're part of something great, and what do you want? You want it to go on forever. And Peter wanted this to go on forever. This felt good. His wife wasn't so mad at him for leaving his nets behind. This was going well. And Jesus starts saying, it's going to come to an end. And I'm going to get arrested and I'm going to die. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I dreamed. That's not what I wanted. This is not what I expected. This is not the will of God that I want. I would rather another will of God, please. <laughs> Ever been there? This is not the will of God that I want. What, Peter, don't you want Jesus to die for the sins of all mankind so that everyone can be saved? Of course he does. Of course he wants everyone to be saved. I don't think Peter got it. I don't think he understood and in his lack of understanding, he's not ready to accept the fact that Jesus is about to walk with these soldiers out of the garden. And so he picks up a sword. And this is what we do. This is what we do. I've got a little slide that summarizes this. Peter believed in Jesus' power, but he did not trust Jesus' plan or Jesus' timing. And so he made Malchus his enemy. That's what we do. If, if things don't go the way that we want them to go, we start to get angry with God. We start to get frustrated with God. This is not what I wanted. And we know that we can't be mad at God. It doesn't feel right as a Christian, amen? So we're not ready to admit that. So we go looking around for somebody else to make the enemy. And we find Malchus. And we pick up our sword against him. Is Malchus the one that decided Jesus had to go to a cross? No. God did. But it was not the plan that Peter wanted. 600 men come in and he grabs his toothpick sword. Why? Because he's in control, darn it. And we want to be in control. Um... Let's get personal, personal with us. We lash out at the enemies in our life, and the reason that we lash out in the enemies, at the enemies in our life is because we desire to control our own pain 
and we are impatient with what God is giving us right now. I'll leave that one up for a second. It's about control. Peter, what's your sword going to do? I don't know, but I want to change the situation. I don't know, but I feel out of control, and I want to be in control again. I'll give you a, a silly little story. There was a time years ago, and I was at a, at a, at a church, and I was being a pastor, and, and somebody uh, left our church, and they wrote this little letter, and, and they were angry at me. They addressed it to me personally. We had a staff of like 10, 10 pastors there, and, but they addressed it to me, and they were mad at me because there was a week that I had uh, preached a sermon, and, and uh, it was one of their birthdays. And I didn't acknowledge their birthday before the sermon started, publicly up front. And we didn't acknowledge birthdays in that church. And so this letter, it's like, and they were so hurt, and they were going to leave the church over it. And I'm a young enough pastor at the time, I'm like, oh my goodness, what do I do with this? Did I really screw up? Is this really terrible? Am I, am I really a bad guy? And all this kind of stuff, and, and I'm not sure what to do with it. And, 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 and it hurt, right? It hurt. And so I take the letter to um, this guy, Frank Cook, and he's our executive pastor at this church, and he's like a Jedi Christian, okay? He's amazing and just knows things. And, and I take this to him, and he reads down through it, and he says, listen, their pain is up here, and what, what has happened is way down here, and there's this huge difference between the two. And he said, whenever I see that, I realize it's not personal. It's not about me. What's really going on is they're angry at God for something. And you were the Malchus. And you were within swiping distance. And, and, and it was helpful for me because I realized I didn't need to take this personally. There's pain here. I didn't. It's okay. But also I learned a valuable lesson from Jedi Frank, because he is an amazing guy. That most of the time when people are angry, their ultimate anger is with God the Father. And when I'm personally angry, I'm ultimately angry with God the Father. And that may really mess with your theology a little bit. But God the Father is the one in control, amen? Amen. And when Jesus gets hauled off and arrested and he's going to the cross, whose fault is it? I mean, there may be people responsible along the way, but doesn't our sovereign God have control of outcomes? Isn't he the one who actually sets in motion the events of this world? And we struggle with that. And sometimes we just don't get the will of God that we wanted. And we love God and we trust God. We trust his power just like Peter did. We know how powerful he is. And we know that he loves us. But sometimes we don't get the outcome that we wanted. Sometimes God disappoints us. Oh, we struggle to say that in church. Because sometimes God disappoints us. And we read the scripture last week about the fact that it's like, you know, the water may splash on you, but you'll never actually drown. God won't let you sink. Do you remember that last week? God won't let you sink. But sometimes it was still a lot more painful than we wanted it to be. And, and in the midst of all of this, I had a marriage and I loved the marriage and everything was beautiful and glorious. And then the person left. And I don't understand why God let that happen. I get excited. I start to spit a lot. Sorry. Sage, sorry. Why did God let that happen? And that's painful. And I know, like, you've been following Jesus for a while. It's like you start to go through those moments in your life where it's like, that's not what I expected to happen. And I don't understand how he could let that happen to me. And it's really, really a struggle. And it messes with you. It messes with your idea of how good God is, right? Or is it just me? It does. And you're like, I didn't think he would allow me to experience this much pain. I didn't think he would take this wonderful blessing in my life and say it's done. And I thought I raised my kids right, and I didn't think they would ever leave. And I raised my kids right, and I didn't think they would ever leave the faith. 
and I don't understand. And I don't understand how God could let this happen. And when I struggle with that, I've got to find somebody to blame. I've got to find somebody to be angry about. And my sword hand starts twitching. Right? It's, like, it's, it's in so many things. And the deeper the relationship, right, the more intimate the relationship, the, the more the trust that was there, and then it breaks and there's betrayal, we feel more and more anger, don't we? Like an ex-spouse, that's the reason you feel so much anger toward that ex-spouse. Because it wasn't supposed to break. And I'm really, really angry with them. And sometimes my words come out in front of my kids, and my kids are raised with this idea that there's an enemy in the house. And our swords are out. And it wasn't supposed to be that way. Jesus reaches out and he heals. Right? It's, it's, it's retaliation or it's restoration. See, Jesus isn't passive in the middle. He's actually healing the ear. That's restoration. Are we blessing? Are we praying? Are we... Even politics. Woo, Politics. Oh, I'm going to be careful. <laughs> hmm. Like, don't be passive, right? Like, do political work. That's good. Be involved. That's good. But sometimes we don't get the outcome that we wanted to get and we have a hard time letting go. And so we start making people enemies. And why all of a sudden are Christians carrying swords around? Is this who we were supposed to be? And some of you really didn't like the outcome when Trump was president. I said it. Some of you really didn't like the outcome when Biden was president. I get it. Some of you are mad about Corona. And you know whose fault it is? The anti-maskers. It's their fault. <laughs> Line them up. Somebody give me a sword. The anti-maskers are the enemy, or the maskers are the enemy, or, or the vaccinated are the enemy, or the anti-vaxxers are the enemy. Are we Christians? Like we're really good at looking at the ethics of Jesus and saying, you know what? It's countercultural. It's countercultural. God cares who you sleep with. There's a sexual ethic here. Like, let's talk about the truth. Let's not, let's not dance around the truth. But how are we good with that truth? And we're not good with a God who says, turn the other cheek and put your sword away and stop aiming for Malchus's head. He says, love your enemies. He doesn't say be passive about it. He says, love them. Oh, and I'm right there with you. And I feel it. So, somebody posted online the other day. They're like, this is this pastor posted it. He said, you know, it's, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Maybe, maybe uh, for a gift for me, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Maybe don't watch so much cable news in the next year. <laughs> and I can relate to that. I could relate to that on either side, guys. Because there's so much like stirring of the anger. Did you hear what they did today? And it's like, what, as a Christian, uh, like be an informed voter. You need some news so that you're informed, so that you can vote well, amen? I'm a part of a democracy, and I have a responsibility as a citizen within the democracy. So do you. I believe in that, absolutely. But I don't have to, to feast on it every single day and ride every little part of the wave, every little bit of anger. Because it is, in, it is in the best interest of many of these people that are speaking to me to keep me angry. To keep me angry. And God's like, don't retaliate. Restore. <sighs> are we all right? Everybody okay? Okay. If you would restore, if you would follow what Jesus says, I believe this will happen in your life. 
if you restore like Jesus. If I pray for Malchus and if I heal Malchus, this is what starts to happen for you. Number one, you get humbled, right? Because everything about an enemy and going after that enemy is I've got to talk myself into the fact that they're evil and I'm good. And how about we just all humble ourselves, see ourselves on the same side of the line that we're all enemies of God. Get humbled. Next one, you get selfless. It's not about me and my need for control, Peter. I can let go of control and I can accept the will of God. Next is I'll get patient. Do you see what what starts to happen to your spiritual growth? It's like Jesus knew what he was talking about. See, if we do this, not only do enemies get saved, but we get saved. That's what this list is. We get saved. Some of you are like, I just don't feel like I've grown spiritually in a long time. I've got to get into a new, fresh Bible study. That's what I got to do. And it's like, that's good. But you really want to grow like a weed spiritually? Love an enemy. Look at what this will do to you. You're going to get patient. You're going to get empathetic. You're going to start thinking about Malchus's feelings. Amen. You're going to start thinking about him and serving him as you're healing his ear. That's what you're supposed to do. And then you're going to get respectful. We're not going to be making speeches about ex-husband all day long in front of the kids and sowing disrespect into them across the generations. Now we're not going to do that. We're going to love our enemy. You're going to get less anger. Of course you're going to get less anger in your life because you're not going to live in anger and stir anger and feed anger. You're going to get that deep forgiveness. You know, I said five years ago that I forgave this person. Why do I still feel so angry? Maybe because you still got the sword in your hand. You said the words, but the actions are over here. Go deep into forgiveness. You get more power if you go this way because you're out of control. Peter was out of control. Who was in control? Jesus was in control. And Peter's actually ignoring Jesus, and he's letting the 600 soldiers determine how he feels. And when you fight against an enemy, you're letting them control how you feel. You want freedom? Love an enemy. And then you get more Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. Very, very last thing, and I know I'm late. In the year 2006, in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, and I just love this story. It starts very, very tragically. Charles Roberts, who was a local milk truck driver in an Amish community, walked into an Amish schoolhouse and shot 10 grade school girls. Five of them died. Then he turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Terrible, terrible tragedy. When they started to pick up the pieces enough to have funerals, At that time, the Amish began to have their own funeral services for their own dead. And then the family of the killer came together to bury him, his widow, and three kids. Several of those Amish families went to the killer's funeral, embraced his widow. Over the next year, they wouldn't just embrace that family They would give money to the widow because they knew she was struggling financially and take care of this man's family. News media didn't know what to do with that. It's a shocking response. But you got some people who regardless of how much they're struggling, how many wounds there are, they're trying desperately to walk the way of Jesus Christ. And when they decided to walk the way of Jesus Christ, they found themselves loving an enemy. Would you guys stand, please? My greatest hope for you today is that you'd be reminded of this critical aspect of who Jesus is. And not only that, but that the Holy Spirit would be all through this room and online that he'd be speaking to us about who our enemy is. And some of you guys right now, you're, you're fighting against that voice. You don't want to hear it. And underneath it isn't just a restoration, 
of you and this enemy. Underneath it is a restoration between you and God himself. Because that's where your anger ultimately is. Your dissatisfaction with the will of God that you've received, it's breaking things between him and you. This is deep waters stuff. But he wants this restored. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, thank you, God, that you come and you decide to be present in a service like this amongst us. Spirit of God, would you x-ray our souls, Lord, and show us exactly what it is that we're wrestling with internally. Come and change us. Come and tell us the truth about ourselves. Come, Lord, and call us to a, a new way. We want to love Jesus, Lord. We want to love people. Father, we love you. We came to church today because we love you. Help us to trust you even in this. In Christ's name.